Well, you heard her. You got to memorize Psalm 139 now. So, hey, open your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes, starting a brand new series today, as Matt mentioned. Ecclesiastes is after the book of Proverbs, after Psalms. And so we are moving forward by starting something new. You might know the name Sir Edmund Hillary. Anybody recognize that name? Sir Edmund Hillary was the first person that conquered Mount Everest in the summer of May 1953. It was a plan that he had for many, many years, and of course, many people had tried and wanted and pined after the idea of climbing Mount Everest. And so, interestingly, as he kind of talks a little bit about his experience, he says when he reached the peak on the mountaintop and the ceiling of the world, he says there was an immediate rush of ecstasy, as you can imagine. It, it finally happened. He had been training and dreaming of this moment for years. And then there was a moment of desolation and despair because the lingering, powerful, provocative question, now what, was resounding upon his mind. One person has said, when you get to the top, you realize that there's nothing there. It's a rather sobering statement. Another person that climbed and conquered Mount Everest had this to say, quote, straddling the top of the world, one foot in China and the other in Nepal, I cleared the ice from my oxygen mask, hunched a shoulder against the wind, and stared absently down at the vastness of Tibet. I'd been fantasizing about this moment and the release of emotion that would accompany it for many months. But now that I was finally here, actually standing on the summit of Everest, I just couldn't summon the energy to care. <laughs> it's a real quote, I promise. I snapped four quick photos, then turned and headed down. My watch read 1.17 p.m., all told, I'd spent less than five minutes on the roof of the world. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting for us to think about this idea of climbing the ladder, climbing the ladder, climbing the ladder of life, only to realize that when you get to the top, there's nothing there. As Beth mentioned, King Solomon lived as the pinnacle. He lived in the pinnacle of humanity. He was on the mountaintop. And, and what was there, he had luxury, every kind of luxury that that time period afforded him, he could indulge. He had riches, he had fame, he had wisdom, he had admiration, he had women, luxury upon luxury. And he enjoyed the fruit of his father David's long labor to see the Davidic kingdom to its pinnacle. And what was there to look at? Well, that's the record of this book, Ecclesiastes. This book is about looking back. It's about looking back at a life when you're on the mountaintop and asking the gigantic, thought-provoking, soul-penetrating question, now what? Or maybe we might say it, so what? Ecclesiastes is a book that compares life to like a, vi like a mist or a vapor, and in the end, you don't really know why you struggled so hard to attain what you have. But this book is not meaningless. In fact, my goal for the next 11 weeks, as well as those that preach this book, is not to thoroughly de depress you. <laughs> uh, this book is full of a lot of statements that might lead us to despair, but it really has a positive outlook because it's not meaningless, and life is not meaningless. Life has meaning. And life only has meaning when we understand what the source of meaning really is. Is it riches? Is it fame? Is it luxury? Is it attainment? Is it career success? Is it family? Is it the large house, the paid off cars, the paid off mortgage, the retirement income? Is that what life is all about? And as we look back to that, we ask the question, what is it all for? And this book has a resounding answer that says, if we find meaning in that, it will prove to be meaningless. But if we find meaning in that which ultimately matters most, that's where life is found. That's the provocative answer that Ecclesiastes offers. One person says this way, 
Solomon hits a nerve. He isolates the very places where you and I have ached lately. And with a probing finger, like a doctor says, does it hurt here? Does it hurt here? Does it hurt here? I think this question that this book raises is the question. It's not only the question of our lifetimes, it's the question of what it means to be a human being. Why do I exist? What is all of this really for? As I'm climbing my own Mount Everest in life, whatever that might be, what is it all for? Let's say I get to the top. Why do I exist? I believe that this book has an amazingly fascinating answer to that question. So the book of Ecclesiastes, I'm going to turn to you here in chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 1 through 11 today as an introduction to this book. And I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 here just as an introduction. And we're going to spend most of our time here, and we're going to spend a lot of time and background of this book because I think we have to get this right. If we really understand the historical context of this book, I think that's when we begin to understand what Solomon means. Solomon says in verses 1 here of chapter 1, the words of the preacher, literally Koheleth, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. The title of the book that you have in your English Bible is, of course, Ecclesiastes. And it's written, it's taken from the uh, Jewish-Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, and literally it means a, a gathering or a call to assembly or one who calls to an assembly. And the person that's speaking here, we meet him in verse 1, he says it's the words of the preacher. Now, that demands a little bit of definition for us. The preacher is not a, a preacher like we might think of today, like I'm doing now. But the preacher here is one who is giving wisdom. Literally, he's one who is assembling together. Some translations call him the teacher. Literally in Hebrew, it's Koheleth. And over and over and over again, we see that he is Koheleth. He identifies himself as the son of David. And I think it's within reason to say that this is not just a son of David in the court of David. This is the son of David, Solomon, who identifies himself again as the preacher. And if he is the one that is writing this book, and I believe that he is, it has to be during the time of his reign in the Davidic kingdom. And so we might date it from 971 to 931 BC. You won't be quizzed on that later, but it's important to remember at least that this book takes place in the life and the reign of King Solomon. And a lot of scholars have speculated that Ecclesiastes is written at the tail end of the reign of King Solomon, whereas Song of Solomon, a book about sexuality and romance, is written at the beginning of his life, the beginning of his manhood. Perhaps Proverbs is written in the middle of his life. Ecclesiastes is written at the end of his life. Another possibility, though, is that Ecclesiastes is actually written through what we might call a midlife crisis lens. It's written from a man, perhaps, somewhere between in his mid-30s to mid-50s. And that's one of the things I absolutely love about this book, and that's why I think it's so apropos for us as a culture, but also as men, to really consider what Solomon has to say here. Perhaps he's looking at uh, at the all of the attainments of his life, as he's attained everything that he can possibly have, and he is struggling to find some degree of meaning. The the purpose of this book, as I've already said, is that Solomon wants us to have a a God-sized, God-centered, what we might call worldview. And and one of the repeated phrases in this book is everything that is written under the sun or everything that is under the sun. And what Solomon wants us to see is that there is an end to the endurance of human wisdom. There, There is an end to it that ultimately leads in some vapid thinking and meaningless thinking. And what Solomon and what God wants us to do is to get over the sun. Now, that doesn't mean that we attain it through some sort of intellectual pursuit and knowledge, but rather that means that we come to understand that which God has already revealed, that He is the source of all meaning, and that we might enjoy life, but enjoy it rightly. Solomon wants us to understand that we can find joy and purpose and delight in that which is good. Our family, our luxuries, things like that, that we might find joy in our, in our work. It's not purely futile, but if we find 
ultimate joy in those things, that's when life becomes meaningless. It brings us to a center point where God is at the center of all of life. This is what's called uh, wisdom literature in the Bible. And the book of Ecclesiastes is pretty different than what we might compare to like in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is the idea where as Solomon is walking throughout life, and this was very uh, popular for kings in that time to do this, but to attain proverbial statements that would encapsulate wisdom or skillful living. And so Proverbs is a lot like jewels. You might go to a jewelry store and the jeweler lays out several diamonds on the black cloth and Solomon says, see, this proverb is like this jewel and this proverb is like that jewel. Whereas Ecclesiastes is a little bit different. It's what's called speculative wisdom, where it's more of a monologue or even an autobiography where Solomon is giving his chokmah, his skillful living, and these are jewels that have been mined out of life through many trials and pain and sorrows. And so what Solomon wants us to do in this book, and this is what he offers us in this book, is that we should ultimately fear God. The, the whole purpose of the book, and we'll repeat this many times, I anticipate, as this series goes on. Turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, if you have your Bibles with you. In chapter 12, uh, we see the ultimate meaning of what all of life is really all about. And this is what this book is about. He, he reserves it to the very end, but I'm going to read it to you today in 1213. He says, this is the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. What Solomon wants us to do is he wants us ultimately to fear God, to live with God in the middle. All is vanity lived underneath the sun. And if you disregard God, ultimately you lose in the end. So if I could just say it very succinctly, I think the major lessons of this book are twofold. Number one, know God, recognize God, and fear Him. And number two, rejoice in life. Let us not be prone to despair, but rather let us smell the roses, as it is often said. Now Solomon offers a complaint, though, in verse 2, and let me read it to you again. This is his complaint as he assesses all of life around him. And he says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanities. The word choice is fascinating for Solomon. It's the word hevel in Hebrew. There's an unusual concentration of these words, in, of this word hevel in Ecclesiastes. It's used some 38 times in this 12-chapter book. Uh, the majority of the occurrences of hevel appear here, and in verse 2 alone, we have five occurrences of hevel. Now, I have the ESV. It translates it vanity. Some other passages or translations might call it meaninglessness or vapor or other words. It is a very elastic word in the Hebrew. And so it might just be better to say hevel. This is the word, and it ultimately means something mist, something vapor, something transitory. And so I'm going to give you an example of hevel. Let me see if I have these here. Yep, I got these. Okay, so uh, I'm really praying this morning that I don't burn down this building. Uh, but this is a perfect example of the book of Ecclesiastes. You ready? Now, all of you are really curious about what's going to happen. You've seen this before. We get into life, and it's an immediate ignition. See that? As our life begins to burn away, perhaps it catches some more wood and some more fuel. And in the early stages of our life, maybe this is the book of Song of Solomon. We're pursuing life. We have vigor. We have energy. We have uh, stamina. And maybe by the end we get to Proverbs or the middle here, and we're thinking about wisdom, and we're thinking about the collection of our lives and the assets that we have and all the different triumphs and accomplishments that we have. But you notice that this little match here is beginning to find its way down to the end. And it's just about to go out. And there's Ecclesiastes. I think some's up there maybe a little bit. It's gone. Would you like to see life and its meaning? 
I have it in my hand. It's Hevel. It's vapor. It's mist. Now that I've thoroughly depressed you, <laughs> the question is often asked about life, what is all of this really for? You're not the first to ask that question, but there are many people that have asked this question. One person named William Moulton Marston, I'm told that he executed a survey here. He asked 3,000 just regular people, what is life all for? And the results of his survey came back. He was absolutely stunned. He thought, well, maybe some would struggle with that question, but a robust 94% said that they have no idea what life is for. 94%. They weren't living for really anything at all. Rather, if they were really pressed, what were they living for? They were living for something to come in the future. So if maybe you're in, the, you're in your middle years and you're just really excited for your kids to finally move out and you can be empty nesters, right? And so you're living for that. Or maybe you're living for that career attainment or you're living for that payoff or you're living for that retirement nest egg where you can finally retire. That's what you're living for. That's defining your purpose, not the present, but the future. It's rather depressing when you really think about it. And Solomon would say that's hevel, that's futile. What about the experts? How do they answer this question? What is life really for? There's a man named Dr. Hugh Moorhead. He was a philosophy professor at Northeastern Illinois University. And he wrote to 250 of the most famous philosophers, scientists, intellectuals on the planet that he knew about. And he asked a very simple question. He asked them, what is the meaning of life? These are the 250 brightest people in the world. And he was stunned as he got answers back. Some people kind of offered something rather mushy, something rather subjective. Some people just flatly said, honestly, Dr. Moore, I have no idea. Some people even emailed him back and said, I don't really know. Do you know the meaning of life? He's like, well, I asked you, right? This is a question that is soul-searching, and the author of Hebrews has much to say. But if we focus only on the things of life, ultimately the toil that we have, the wisdom that we attain, the righteousness that we have, the wealth, the prestige, he says, the pleasure, the youth, and the vigor, even life itself, even the future after death, if we're focusing only on these things, Solomon says five times, that it's vanity, it's futile, it's vapor, it's transitory. And so Solomon has much to say here about, again, what might be described as a midlife crisis. And I don't mean to laugh at that. I think that's what most men, nearly all men go through specifically, some women as well. But when you reach about your early 40s, maybe your late 30s for some, to about your mid-50s, you're, you're asking some questions, and I think this book raises some questions for us to think about. And so a midlife crisis, what are the catalysts that might cause some of these things? Well, for a man, his body begins to betray him. Uh, he begins to not have as much stamina as he's working out in the yard, you know, by the mid-40s. I felt that this weekend, by the way, at New Life Ranch. I got tired. Some of the younger guys that were with us, they were, they, were, they were much in better shape than I was, and you get tired, right? And so you begin to feel some level of despair. Uh, another enemy of, in the man's life specifically is his work. And, and certainly in your early 30s, you know, you're reaching, you're attaining, you're trying to climb perhaps that corporate ladder. And as the saying goes, sometimes that ladder you find out when you get to the top is on the wrong wall. And as you're enjoying your corner office, maybe that you work so hard to attain, you begin to get frustrated about the futility of it all, the circular nature of it all, the, the round and round and round. You start one week after another, one meeting after another. Perhaps for some men, some of the source of futility in this midlife crisis is anchored in his own family. You work really hard at work, and you attain that paycheck that you want, and all of a sudden your paycheck is nibbled to death by ducks. And then some of those ducks are called braces, or insurance, or doctor's bills, or vet bills, or whatever that might be in your life. And you begin to feel frustrated, and you begin to feel tired, and you begin to wonder what it's all for. 
Uh, Most concerning, perhaps one of the markers of a midlife crisis is you begin to question your relationship with God Himself. You begin to wonder if He cares. Maybe you sound like Solomon here, vanity of vanities, as you say. One person has said this, the midlife man pictures God leaning over the banister of heaven, grinning fiendishly and pointing a long bony finger, and he says, you despicable, disgraceful Christian. You are the worst possible example of a mature man. You are selfish. You are filled with lust. You are lazy. You are so disgusting that I want to spew you out of my mouth. And while none of that is true, maybe that's how some of us feel. Of course, this is not the God of the Bible, and this is not the God that we worship. But we might wonder if God can ever really be happy with us. And so Solomon provides us here in verses 3 to 11 some pictures that kind of bring us back to this understanding of the futility of life and the futility of the circular nature of life. Read with me, and I'm going to read all the way from 3 to 11. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and it goes around to the north, round and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full to the place where the streams flow. There they flow again. All things are full of weariness, Koholet says. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new. It has already, it has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Solomon offers some observations here at the futility of life, and he says the first thing here in verse 3, and it's the phrase that he often says in this book, what does a man gain by the toil at which he toils under the sun? And so this idea, again, of being under the sun is the Litmus. It's the, it's the journey, I think, of human wisdom, of attaining that which we can ultimately attain with our own understanding, our own sense of well-being, our own sense of revelation, and ultimately it leads to futility. And then he offers several examples here of cycles, cycles in the regular normal world, in the physical world. Uh, a few weekends ago, I had the opportunity to take my two boys to a NASCAR race in Austin, Texas. And I would not be mistaken as a NASCAR fan by any stretch, but I'll just say after that weekend, it was awesome. (laughs) I had never experienced anything like that before. And I didn't know this, but this was like a whole weekend kind of thing. Like we got there on Friday night, we spent all Saturday at the track. There were like three different kinds of races. There was qualifying and you know the best part about it, it was in the rain. NASCAR raced in the rain. It was so cool. And it was, and you might think that sounds miserable, but I'm going to tell you, it was awesome. It was an amazing experience as we're walking up to this track in Austin. I mean, you can hear these cars roaring down the straightaways. And and everybody told me, you know, you go to a NASCAR race, one thing that you cannot prepare for is the noise level. It just doesn't do it justice on TV. You know, we actually have a race today, so you can turn your television up, you know, all the way and blow the speakers out, and it still won't accomplish what it's like to be there. And so all day Saturday, we were at the track. They had Lamborghinis there. That was pretty awesome. Makes a much different sound than the stock cars, you know, you know, and it was just really, really cool. And then on Sunday, it was like the main event. It was the Cup Series, and it was so awesome. And it was just intense to see these cars go round and around, and around, and around, and around. I'm not sure exactly how many laps it was, but you get the picture. Life sometimes feels like that, right? As you look at all of life, and Solomon offers a few things here. He talks about generations. One generation goes around, dies off. There's another generation around, and it goes, or the sun rises, and the sun goes down, 
Here he talks about the wind. He talks about the streams. Interestingly, he uses the word halak here. It means to walk or to journey for all of these metaphors. As the sun halaks across the sky, it goes back to where it started. And from an ancient Near Eastern perspective, you can understand that as they were looking at the normal natural world around them. He offers several assessments of the routine around him. I I heard this story about a child who just learned to tie his shoelaces. He was six years old, and his mother was so proud of him, but this child begins to kind of whimper and begins to get really sad, and before long is beginning to sob, and the mom says, honey, what's wrong? He says, mom, I, I learned how to tie my shoes. She said, well, that's wonderful. Why are you so upset? Because I have to do it now for the rest of my life. <laughs> That's Ecclesiastes. <laughs> That's Ecclesiastes. I remember when I was learning how to mow the yard, my dad said, well, you get to do it now every weekend. So, Thanks, Dad. In verse 8, Solomon says, the eye is full of weariness. Man uh, cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied uh, with seeing or the ear filled with hearing. And isn't that the truth? Especially as we go throughout life, we want and we pine for more and we want and we want. It's like Christmas for a child. You want so bad that Christmas present, you open it up and then like December 26th, I don't even remember what I got for Christmas. What did you get for Christmas this last year? Do you remember? Some of you might remember, most of us don't. The ear is never satisfied with the juicy gossip, the thirst for more, the attainment for more, and all of that can lead to a sense of futility, of frustration. Next week, we're going to look at a little bit more at this idea of there's nothing new under the sun, and I think this is a great corrective for all the false teaching that we see in the world around us. And we're going to spend some time thinking about all the false doctrines that seem to be new today, but honestly are very, very old. In fact, one of the oldest false doctrines is written and proposed by a man named Arius in 325 AD at Nicaea. He advocated that Jesus Christ, as great as he was, he was a created being. And there are so many cults today and so many religions that would say as much that Jesus Christ is not the Savior of the universe. He's not the Savior of the world. He's not the creator. He is a created being. He's a secondary, lesser being. And I would just say to the Jehovah's Witnesses that come to your door, there's nothing new under the sun. Your advocacy for something novel is in fact something that is incredibly old and tired and dated. And so let me just park it here and just land the plane and ask us some questions to consider as we begin this book. Is this all there is? Is this all there is as you take stock of your life? Maybe it does feel like NASCAR. I like what Haddon Robinson had to say, you will invest your life in something or you will throw it away on nothing. You will invest your life in something or you'll throw it away on nothing. And I believe the answer to Ecclesiastes and the answer to this question is a profound no. There's so much more to life than that which we can attain. There's so much more to life than that which we can gain, so much more to life than that which we can somehow accomplish. And all of this points us back, all roads lead us back to the center point where God himself is at the center. And if you remove God like much, many people in our culture have done, if you deny his existence, ultimately, yes, it is futility. If you are an atheist and have an atheistic worldview, it is futile. But if you believe in God and God is at the center, ultimately life has meaning. And life has meaning because it tells all there is to say about Him. As the sun comes up and the sun comes down, we look at the natural world order and we say, what a God. What a God to place us here in this solar system orbiting around this ball of fire that if it was just out of this range or that range, we would cease to exist. What a God to have the moon placed where he has it in all the cycles in the solar system that we have life and we have fullness because it testifies ultimately to him. What a God that creates the universe and creates this earth with the beaches and the sand and the ocean and the waves and the cyclical nature that point back to the uh, enormity of his mind and his intellectual abilities and creativity. What a God to see these waves crash over and over and over. And we say with great rejoicing, only God could do this. 
Only God. Everything outside of him is meaningless, but he is the one that gives your life purpose. Your purpose is to exalt him, to affirm and exhort him how great he is and that we would find joy in life because he created life to be enjoyed ultimately because it points us back to him. But there's one way to achieve that purpose, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus came into this life, and he lived a life of purpose and accomplishment. He lived a life of service. He lived a life, ultimately, of sacrifice. And he went to the cross for sinners, and he went to the cross to die a sinner's death and to atone for the debt that sinners owe to a holy God. And his life had great meaning so that in turn our lives by belief in him and what he accomplished through the death and resurrection that we might have meaning, we might have joy. In a few moments, church family, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper together. And this is a great Sunday to do it as we're thinking about that which is. And we think about all of life that is. And life ultimately is enjoyed only in God and what he has accomplished through Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper is a picture of his death and burial and the accomplishment for our salvation, the suffering that Jesus went through on our behalf. Would you join with me in a word of prayer, and I'll give you some further instructions after I pray. Father, that is our prayer, is that we would now take this time in solitude and quietness of our hearts, Lord, that we would meditate on your goodness, on the meaning that you give us, that, Lord, that we would meditate on all there is in this life, ultimately, that points back to you, and it points back to the accomplishment of your dear Son, our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, through him and him alone, that we might have life, and have life everlasting in his sacrifice, in his death, and blood that he shed for sinners. It's in Christ's great name that we pray. Amen.